Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. We are joined today, first of all, by the MacArthur Award winning historian Christopher Beckwith. Chris is the Professor of Central Eurasian Studies at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, and he specialises in Asian language studies, linguistics, and in the history of Central Eurasia. His books include Empires of the Silk Road, A History of Central Eurasia from the Bronze Age to the Present, which won the 2009 Prose Award of the Association of American Publishers for Best Book in the category World History and Biography Autobiography, Warriors of the Cloisters, The Central Asian Origins of Science in the Medieval World, and his latest work, Greek Buddha, Pyro's Encounter with Early Buddhism in Central Asia. And this is going to be the topic of our talk today. We are also joined by the philosopher and chair of the society, Robert M. Ellis, who is no stranger to the podcast. He's recently written a uh, review of the book, and he's here to join Christopher in discussion about it. Hello, Chris. Um, welcome Hi. to the Middle Way Society podcast. Uh, thank you. And hello, Robert. Welcome back. Hello. OK, well, Chris, could we start by you telling us a bit about your background, how you became interested in Central Eurasian Studies, and what prompted you to um, write this particular book? Um, OK, well, uh, my interest in Central Eurasia goes back a long way. But uh, basically, that reading a book, uh, my mom had had got from the library, and I, I was home from Taiwan. I was studying in graduate school already in Chinese literature, and I read this book, and I thought, "Wow, I want to, <laughs> I want to look, find out more about that. I look into that topic." And uh, so I, uh, I then, when I was applying, I was already applying to graduate school, and I found this strange department where they sort of specialized in things like that. Just by accident, I found it. So instead of applying to a Chinese department, I applied to that one. And that was the one which is now the department that I'm working in. Uh, but my interest in um, in, uh, in philosophy goes back. Uh, I've never been, um, up until recently, ever really did any serious work on philosophy. I, I got interested in it when I was in college. I took a philosophy course. Yeah. And uh, the professor uh, had one unit, one lecture on skepticism, classical Greek skepticism, um, and which was basically the, the teachings uh, the you know, Sextus Empiricus in his preserved works. But um, I thought, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> I was mostly bored in that class. And uh, some of the things I just could hardly tolerate. But I mean, I liked the ancient Greek stuff. But anyway, so I, I immediately went to the library and read the complete works of Sextus Empiricus. And I thought, this is fabulous stuff, you know. So and I was also studying Chinese. So I took a class of Chinese philosophy. Um, and I wrote a paper on uh, on Taoism, comparing Taoism with skepticism, as I describe in my my acknowledgments, I think. And um, I thought that was very interesting, and somehow similar to you know this this kind of Taoism was similar to uh, classical skepticism. And I didn't pay really much more attention after that. I was v sort of vaguely interested in Taoism and vaguely interested in in uh, classical skepticism and uh, Puranism, actually. And um, so I, um, I let it go, and then periodically, uh, because I ended up studying as my major language for my doctorate, I ended up studying Tibetan, because mm -hmm. it just happened to be that the teacher was the best teacher, and he was fantastic, and he was a pioneer in Tibetan studies, and he was a great teacher. And the language is just so strange, so amazing, you know. It's just totally backwards and upside down from everything else you know. And this is just a great language, and so I just and it had a beautiful writing system and a long tradition. I thought, oh, this is cool. I got to study this instead of what I was thinking of studying at that time. And of course, doing Tibetan studies, you, you get exposed to a lot of Buddhism. Most Tibetan literature is um, Buddhist, um, so I, I got exposed to it. I had read more here and there, worked on things here and there uh, connected to Buddhism, and never really focusing on it much until I was working on my, I think. Uh, I think it started when I was working on Empires of the Silk Road, the history of Central Eurasia. And I had to go read all this stuff. You know, I'm not a specialist. You can't be a specialist in everything by definition. So I had to read a lot of other people's works in order to, and incorporate 
uh, my understanding of, of their, their, their fields, their specializations into this survey of this 4,000 years of history and a vast territory. So while doing this, I read a lot of things and um, somehow, I, I don't know, in the middle of that, I think I got interested in, in, in Pyro again or Pyrrhonism. Yeah. And I got, read something, I think. Uh, probably it was, uh, I'm not sure it was Richard Betts' book right away, but Richard Beck's, Betts' book on Pyro or on or an early Pyrrhonism. Um, which um, is probably still the best thing written on early Pyrrhonism. I don't agree with his interpretation. He, he, he takes the, the view that Pyrrho was a skeptical, was, was a, sorry, was a, um, a dogmatic a meta, metaphysician. Yeah. Uh, so he's mainly interested in metaphysics, and it was a dogmatic sort of thing, ultimately. Anyway, so I liked the book, and at some point I thought, okay, i got to look into this some more. And so I had to read the texts, the main texts. There, there aren't very many and analyze them. And as I was doing that, I just got more and more into it and wrote a long article on the main texts and um, um, in Greek. And then I decided to, um, you know, I, I got a, a grant to uh, this institute in Germany, in Bochum, which is a comparative uh, religious history institute. And I spent a year there. And while doing that, I, I wrote the first manuscript, the draft manuscript of this book. Okay, well, Chris, could we, um, I know you can only give a shot, snapshot in sort of 10 minutes or so, but could you make an attempt to give us an, as an overview of the book? Okay, basically, and I mentioned the title, the, 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 you mentioned in your review, Greek Buddha is a misnomer. It's not, it's, it, it's actually referring to Pyrrho. Ah, right. Uh-huh, yes, yeah, so that's why I, I never thought so, that somebody would interpret it as possibly meaning that the Buddha was Greek or something, but it was simply, I mean, Pyrrho was a Greek, yeah. and he you know, became a kind of an enlightened being, you might say. Uh, so, but, uh, and his teachings were uh, the same teachings, basically, as, as taught by the Buddha. I mean, the earliest, the ones we can figure out on the basis of the data. Um, so that's why I, I thought of that this. That really didn't occur to me that, that it referred to Pyrrha because um, he, he's, well, obviously, he's presented as a follower of the Buddha, isn't he? Well, and he's not mm -hmm. presented particularly as an enlightened yeah. Well, he's not really presented that way anywhere except in, in mm. right things that are being written today, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the area. thing that my original focus for it was okay. If 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 uh, what I'd read, you know, what I was thinking about, looking into the material and everything like that, if uh, if his teachings were basically Buddhist, well, what kind of Buddhism was it? It wasn't the kind of Buddhism that you see, in, uh you know about the periodization of the actual texts that we have. The actual early, oldest texts we have are these Gandhari uh, manuscripts that were found uh, fairly recently in the area between a uh, border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, those mountains in there. There are some monasteries where there were some uh, deposits were found. And they're in this uh, Prakrit language. So it's an early Indic language, but not Sanskrit. And um, the people, there are several big international projects uh, working on uh, preservation and the uh, this transcription, translation, study of all these texts. Uh, so uh, when you look at those texts, uh, those texts are very similar doctrinally to what's in the Pali Canon. But um, all of this stuff is uh, reflecting a very some very late developments, apparently. And there are things, there's indications of that just in those texts themselves, uh, the way they present themselves. So I, I thought, well, okay, if, if we have this other material, which we do have some of, uh, Megasthenes is very important, um, and uh, Puro, assuming that's correct, you know, then what does that say? Well, and there's also the Chinese information. There is, uh, I wouldn't say Taoism is a, a kind of early Buddhism, even the early Taoism, but it has these early Buddhist elements in it. It's very clear. Some of them are, are very specific um, markers kind of of early Buddhism. And the name Gautama, uh, that's the name, <laughs> the actual name of Lao Tzu is not Lao Tzu, it's Lao Dan, which if you go back to, to the to the linguistics like I do, then it's uh, reconstructable as, as Gautama, Gautama, that's, that's the proper form of the name Gautama. So the name is there, you got some things, some ideas, so that's another uh, a testimony. So we have several testimonies. Sorry, if I yeah. could just interrupt you, Chris, you're telling us a lot about the process that you went through, the thinking process, yeah. which is, is interesting, I'm sure anyone who who reads the mm. book will be who has yeah. read the book be interested in that. But what struck me more reading the book was the extraordinary conclusions you've reached. Uh -huh. So right. may, I'm thinking maybe it would be easier for people to relate to if we work back a bit more from those conclusions. I mean, the, for example, uh -huh. that that um, the Buddha was was a Scythian to start right. with. I mean, right. 
um, yes, or, or yes. that uh, that what you've just said about Lao Tse is, is, is um, or that the Buddha wasn't born in the Ganges Valley. I mean, these are all astonishing things for most people uh-huh. who've studied Buddhism. Did you have a sense while you were researching and, and doing this that you were actually producing something, you know, so uh, radical in a sense, or something mm-hmm. completely revisionary? Um, no, I, I, <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't set out. I never set out to produce anything radical. What mm-hmm. I'm only interested in is solving the problems, solving the puzzle, and making uh, things as clear as possible, and improving knowledge and improving uh, understanding of things. That's mm-hmm. really what I'm always interested in. And people mm-hmm. think because when I do that then you have the edifice uh, that has been erected by people over uh, sometimes a very long time. And uh, that one says such and such, things are X. Well, I look at the data, and the data is what you have to look at, and the data can't be interpreted in some uh, in the way to give you X. So instead it gives you Y. So then I said, let's look at the data and then see what we get. And we get Y, and I, I describe Y. And I'm not really interested in, in X very much. Mm-hmm. Unless there's information in the X, some of X, which is relevant. So you mentioned uh, uh, things such as uh, Buddha. Well, his name, his ep- his epithet, Shakyamuni, is the Sanskrit form of the the, the oldest form is, is Shakyamuni, and it just even either way, it still means uh, sage of the Scythians. The Sakas are it's just another word for Scythian. It, it is the same word, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's another. It's the uh, Eastern pronunciation of the word Scythian. Mm-hmm. What is another one uh, you mentioned? Uh, that uh, he undoubtedly came from the area of Gandhara, not from Magadha. Uh, he may have gone to Magadha, may have worked there, taught there, died there. I'm, that's cool. I'm fine with that. It doesn't make any difference really where. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it doesn't make sense for him to have come from there in, uh, in the, that he had to have had contact with or exposure to Zoroastrianism in order to be able to react against it the way he did. It's very clear that he's reacting against specifically specifically Zoroastrian ideas, or by the way, early Zoroastrian ideas. If you look up Zoroastrianism, I, I'm just mm. been re- early this morning, I was looking at a book, a recent book on Zoroastrianism, and it's just full of this well, it's late Zoroastrianism, shall we say. And it's yeah. talking about it's talking about the Zoroaster and the early stuff, but it's all couched in this late Zoroastrian understanding of everything and you know, scholars' theories and so on. And mm. if you look at Buddhism, you will get the same thing. It's always... The attempts to understand early Buddhism are all seen through the eyes of a very late Buddhism, in fact. And so that's why I tried looking at the earliest sources. That's the reason for my methodology. The so-called Ashokan inscriptions, some of them are good. They provide good information, very early information, those ones by David Nampriya Priyadarshi. The other ones that are explicitly Buddhist are very late, much later. They're uh, they're by somebody else. They don't say they're by David Nampriya Priyadarshi. A couple of them say they're by Ashoka. And so those have to be separated out. So the whole story, the tradition about Ashoka, all that stuff, I'm sorry, that was, it's even more re- revolutionary, in fact, mm. yeah. than what I say about Shakyamuni. Other people have mm. said Shakyamuni means Scythian sage. Yeah. I mean, you, you put a lot of store on datable documents, don't you? That, that is, it strikes is. me that your historical case is very much based on the idea that datable documents are reliable mm. and undatable ones are at least mm-hmm. much less reliable. I mean, could you say more about why that's an important part of your method? Uh, it's a historical method. Uh, in in uh, history is the study of human uh, events or human things uh, over time. The time. So chronology is of a crucial importance. Uh, the oldest sources on things, not always guaranteed to be the best. Sometimes you'll have a late one, which is actually a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy that goes back to an even older one. Okay, the case of Eusebius, the, the text on Piro, the best text is preserved in Eusebius's introduction to the gospel. Well, that's kind of a couple centuries AD. And then we go back, uh, it's a copy of uh, another text uh, by Timon, which is in reporting what, it's, it reports a, a historical history of philosophy, which quotes Timon, which who's quoting a Puro. So we got, you know, four mm-hmm. moves. Uh, but yeah, that's the problem. But uh, if you have, but that has been studied a lot. And so we've got that pretty well narrowed down and we know what it is, where it's coming from, and uh, and each of those bits of information. And, and so when you take the canon, for example, or the canons, 
uh, of Buddhism and took at the cano- look at the canonical literature. There are all kinds of things there, and people have been trying to figure that out for a long time. What's the old? What are the oldest texts? You know, what are the oldest teachings and so on? And I have to respect that to some extent. So I've looked at the best scholarship there and to see what they say. Uh, Luis Gomez, for example, and you know, Greg Chopin and scholars like that who are very critical and, 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 and looking at the way, what does it say? What do the texts say? You know, what do they tell us? When does this text date to? And Greg Chopin comes to the astounding conclusion, it's inescapable, that the Vinaya isn't earlier than the 5th century A.D. There's no the Vinaya, as we have the Vinayas, there are several Vinayas, uh, but they are not earlier than that. They're even dated, some of them. That doesn't mean that there wasn't something like the Vinaya, you know, the, the uh, uh, Pratimoksha and so on like that goes back, back pretty far. But the Vina, as we have them, are very late. Right, so, well, so what are you going to say to more traditional-minded Buddhists who will, mm-hmm. I mean, they rely on the idea of an oral tradition, don't they? And yes. the idea of there being reliability in the oral tradition. So would you, yeah. would you discount that? No, no, not at all. And by the way, I, I point this out specifically in here that I'm uh, not for or against any religious system and uh, I, I think that all religions have something uh, to teach us and there's good in all of them mm-hmm. and um, that religions like everything else uh, human changes over time it all changes does that mean it's bad I don't think so I mean it's just the way it is like Buddha said you know all things change so uh, it just changes and so I'm sure there's a lot of good things in, in uh, contemporary Buddhism I don't know much about it but um uh, Things that are, you know, good and admirable and worthwhile. And uh, I just happen to be, because of my my approach to things, is I find a problem and then I narrow zoom in on that thing, and I try and use everything I can thing that I have in my hands, uh, in my brain, to try and solve those problems. And that's linguistic, uh, it's logic, it's uh, you know historical experience and, and reading texts and so on. But but if the Pali Kalan is not um as you sort of intimate in the book, a reliable guide to the life and times of the Buddha, it does mm-hmm. beg the question how reliable a guide it is to his thought and practice. Yeah. Um, there are, th- the thing is, the Pali Canon is gigantic, right? The Chinese Buddhist Canon is gigantic. I've yeah. worked on that. I haven't worked that much on the, the Pali Canon, but uh, I little dabbled in it. Uh, the Tibetan Buddhist Canon, there's a huge collection of thousands of works. And uh, they're dated all over the spectrum. Some of them are fairly old. Some of them are fairly new. Yeah. Some, many in between. And um, some of them have bits in them that which are useful. And the scholars have said, well, look, this bit here uh, is one of the oldest bits, and it goes. It's attested this way. It's, it's talked about that way. It looks like it's pretty old. So when I'm looking at the things in the Greek material, or the, you know, the Chinese or the the early Indian inscriptions. And I'm trying to understand them. Then I, I look for things that, okay, what is this? Where, how does it show up in the canon? Okay, that's how I'm doing it. I'm not starting with the canon, which is just, you can't start with it. Nobody does. It's just too, too gigantic. Unless you're saying, okay, I'm going to deal with the organization of it. You know, all right, that's fine. People do that. And then they talk about the titles and which sets things go on, which set and so on, which basket. Um, I just I don't find that particularly interesting myself. But, um, but it, I, so I'm using the canon, you might say. Uh, as um, additional data uh, to be examined, examined to help figure out what was going on. And while doing that, that's when I became interested in early Buddhism. Before that, I wasn't particularly interested in it. It was because I was trying to figure out what was going on with Piro's um, ideas especially, but also what Magasini says, which is very interesting, uh, I wanted to find out. So that's uh, how I got involved in using the, the text. So uh, I think uh, in that recent posting on your site there was somebody who criticized uh, quoted a crit- criticism from a, a buddhist scholar buddhologist i, I expect there will be a lot of that so mm-hmm. i don't i don't really have any response I, i'm not a buddhologist uh, people, somebody who specializes in uh, you know, comparing buddhist texts and studying buddhist texts uh, per se for their own sake I have a lot of colleagues who are. I, I, I read things. I've, I've, I've reviewed you know, stuff on this and so on. So I, I'm familiar with it. But, uh, but I, I'm not interested in that particularly myself. Yeah. Okay. So what sort of responses have you had from, from colleagues who are buddhologists? Um, I've had mostly pretty positive ones. I mean, the people who, who, who are, have uh, negative responses to it are not too likely to 
write to me and say, hey, I read your book and I thought it really was terrible. You know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, but um, the comments that I've gotten either during the, at the manuscript stage uh, or since um, have mostly been uh, been supportive. And uh, a lot of people have, have said you know, good things about it. So a little bit better than I expected, actually. I mean, what I found particularly interesting about your book is that um, it meshed or, or provided a historical uh, explanation for a new historical light, if you like, on uh, a problem I've always had with Buddhist teachings and the consistency mm-hmm. of Buddhist teachings. So, so you place the early teachings of the Buddha, which are, are compatible with Piro. Mm. You know, that's early Buddhism, as I understand it, as you're presenting yes. it. Um, yep. and, and then the overall message seems to be that the later, uh, well, the things which are often seen as core Buddhist teachings, such as the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, Karma and Rebirth and so on, mm-hmm. that these are, uh, you know, several centuries later than the mm-hmm. than the time of the, of the Buddha yes. as you as you trace him. And um, so, for me, the issue has, has always been well, in the, these inconsistencies in the Buddhist teaching that that mm-hmm. on the one hand you've got the early teaching, which is basically the Middle Way which rejects metaphysics and avoids metaphysics. Mm. And then you've mm. later on, you've got all these Buddhist teachings which appeal to uh, yeah, metaphysical yes. authorities, which come from the revelation from the enlightenment of the Buddha. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there seemed to be a contradiction, and I couldn't find a historical explanation mm-hmm. for that. But you seem to offer one. So, so that's what's particularly interested me for that. But, I mean, mm-hmm. did, you, did you have that sense when you were writing the book that you were resolving an issue in the teachings of Buddhism, the contradiction that you um, found there. That's uh, that came to my mind, but um, I was really interested in, in getting rid of the problems. Um, there's, that's what, to me one of the problems, one of the things that it distracts from the core topic. So mm. this is just it's irrelevant. And by the way, some uh, uh, Buddhologists have uh, long ago concluded that uh, the Four Noble Truths is, is a late teaching. Um, the Eightfold mm-hmm. Path is the late teachings. They, they sort of systematize things. So one of the giveaways of that, but uh, that they are in fact much later than, than what we call what I'm calling early Buddhism. So I just went with that too, and I said, well, they say that too, so mm-hmm. out, out it goes. <laughs> you know? right. But it, it doesn't make any sense, as you said, absolutely right, and I was aware of that. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Mm. So do you think that has any implications for Buddhism? You know, you know for example. Do you think that Buddhists need to recognize this this contradiction, for example? Uh, hmm. uh, I don't know. I mean, like I said, religion changes. Every kind of uh, human endeavors and human ideas, all of these, they, they all change. So I I'm, I think it's just part of Buddhism today to have these, uh, you know, worlds and, uh, you know, you know, mandalas and all that stuff. <laughs> uh, and the conceptualization of, of the universe it's, it, some people find it very interesting, and uh, and I can see how it's, it's attractive to find it interesting and maybe appealing, and um, so it's fine with me. But it doesn't seem to have really anything to do with the uh, the, the the early teachings, which are the, where Buddhism is coming from, and they're still there in Buddhism. And I, I I believe that that's one of the core features of Buddhism to this day. It's just simply a continuation of those early teachings. But there's all the there are all these other things that have come up. So um, uh, I'm not sure to what extent that uh, I would want to pay attention to that if I were really focused on on those those basic I guess the basic teachings. Um, There's an issue here, particularly I think for for more secular minded Buddhists, maybe secular Buddhists as often call themselves, that uh, yeah. the compatibility with science and and um, uh-huh. so oh, so okay. it'll be easier to for example to reconcile Piro's teachings yes. Uh, yes. as you present them as early Buddhism with a scientific perspective than uh, yes. it is to, to reconcile karma and rebirth, for example, with that scientific perspective. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, it does simplify things. Uh, if, and I'm interested in the science, as you, as you may know from my other book, uh, Warriors of the Cloisters, which uh, is very much focused on um, what Buddhists were doing in those, those monasteries. And it turns out to be very interesting um, so far as science is concerned. But Nobody ever noticed that before. So, and so far, nobody else seems to be studying it. And it's just, I put it out there. You would think somebody was, I say, look, nobody's worked on this text. You know, we don't have a, a, any treatment of it at all. 
the earliest ones. I mean, why not, you know, they're sitting there in the Chinese canon, you know, in the Taisho Tripitaka. Well, why doesn't somebody work on, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't know. So, I do my best. <laughs> so what but, do you think that, what do you get from that uh, in, in relation to scientific method today? Uh, yes, it is the, the, the ancestor of what we call the traditional scientific method. Uh, that's what it was. They were doing it, but they were arguing, and that's what people do a lot in this academic, what became an academic institution, uh, the monasteries, the monastic colleges. So they, they argued, debated about things and uh, in, a, in a particular way, and they did it in this unusual way, which developed and became this, what's known as the scholastic method, it used to be known as the scholastic method in Western European medieval studies, uh, the method used by Thomas Aquinas, uh, that kind of thing for arguing with listing arguments and arguments against arguments and so on. Uh, and it turns out to be extremely interesting. So I, I got interested in the argument and how it works and the logic behind it, and the recursion, uh, that sort of thing. But uh, it, it comes from the Buddhists talking about Buddhism. Would you say that the provisionality found in the best scientific investigation is... Provisionality? So maintaining a, maintaining a, a provisional perspective, uh -huh. which can be revised in the light of new evidence. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. is, that, is mm -hmm. that part of what you discovered in, in these uh, texts? Um, that's certainly coming from uh, uh, studying the material that, that, goes, that went into Greek Buddha, yes. And, uh, and my, uh, my further thought about it, and, and working on Hume, of course, and uh, what he was getting at is, as a, a Pyrrhonian, a self-proclaimed uh, Pyrrhonian, and what that means for science. And um, what it means is, that he thought, he actually thought there was still a problem there. And as, as Sexus Empiricus kind of thought there was a problem because everybody is raised with the same kind of idea uh, since Aristotle anyway, before Aristotle, but you can't blame them. I like Aristotle. Uh, but anyway, with the idea of what I call rectilinear logic and um, traditional logic, which is not mapped on our world, which is, as Einstein said, it's curved. <laughs> I like that idea. But, I mean, our logic is circular. Our, our induction is in, we can't think without it. Uh, we, you know, we, we think that way. So if we, if we work on it from that point of view, um, then we end up with a, a, a different approach to, to science. Um, so that the science, we, and we, I, as I mentioned in Chapter 4, that, that things have to be, there. it's an imperfect world. So uh, it's, everything is, because it's imperfect, it's gradable. It's not all the same. It's not just one perfect thing. There are lots of different things of the same variety. We categorize them. We put those categories on, as, as Piero said, and it's according to traditional logic, that's wrong. It's, it makes it circular. We put the categories on, and then we think about it, and we use those categories to interpret it. It's completely circular. But all of our thinking is like that. So our, our logic is fundamentally circular or non-rectilinear. So that's why I call it the vice of circular logic. How do we think? But, but when you apply that to science, then the scientists are doing this and excusing themselves, saying, oh, sorry, yeah, I know it's not justifiable by philosophy. Science is not justifiable. We're doing it anyway because we want to find out, like Aristotle, we want to find out. We want to find out. He had his own logic, which is rectal in here. But he still, he was mainly interested in just finding out how things worked. You know, that's what he was. So he was trying to analyze it in the way, the best way he could, which was maybe not the best way. But the scientists are doing it. They're doing it in their way. And they are, you know, aware uh, to some extent that yeah it can't be perfect and we're going to do the best we can we get the best measurements we can it's not the best but not perfect measurements but they're the best ones we can and collect as many as possible because we know that some of those are going to be bad anyway <laughs> so when you apply that logic to it um, then say wait a minute what they're saying is it, it's not all wrong and it's not you know unjustifiable in fact it's simply normal way of thinking what Hume said you know, his, his, what did he say, uh, skeptical solution, which is a kind of a, a cop-out sort of thing. Well, we just live anyway, you know, according to the phenomena. Yeah, what else do we have besides phenomena? I mean, okay, maybe there's something. If you push hard enough on these atoms in the air, you know, you'll find them. They'll be little hard, round, smooth things, you know, and and it'll be really there. It really exists for, you know, in, imperfectly. It's, it's, you know, it's a God atom or something. I don't know what what people have in their minds. But in fact, we don't have anything like this. Everything is just what we, I'm, I'm talking to you. I think that I'm talking to you and I think I'm talking to you <laughs> and you think you're listening to me and we think about these things and we think we see all this world. It's just phenomena. And, and if you try and get beyond that, 
that's what Piro was criticizing, and I think the Buddha too, is saying, okay, what we think about the world, and what we do about the world, that's one thing. But he's saying that thinking about thinking about the world, taking it one step removed or two steps removed, uh, that's a meta theory. And meta theory is doubly bad, you know, in a sense, because it's just using our the results that we get usually from rectilinear logic and end up um, going through the circular vice, you know, ending up with nonsense pretty much. It doesn't make any sense. So that's why it doesn't make sense, and that's why he's able to disprove all of it. Uh, but then it makes us – I would really want to know. I'm not a logician. I would really like to know what a logic based on uh, non-rectilinear logic – I spoke to a logician that I know, the only one I know, and uh, we, we discussed it. And it turns out somebody used non-linear. I wanted to use non-linear. Oh, it's already been used by somebody in computer science. It's being used now. You know, so I can't use it. That term is taken. Okay. So how about rectilinear, non-rectilinear? Okay, it's longer, but but that's what it is. And that's the way we think. Could we characterize that differently? I mean, yeah, rather yeah, than thinking yeah. of it in terms of, of logic, is it not also at least a question of cognitive bias or of a tendency to yeah. go around positive feedback loops, confirmation bias, mm-hmm. so that we assume that our deductive logic is perfect? Uh, um, oh, wow. But, but that's surely yeah. about the way in which we use logic rather than needing to actually completely change the logic. Yeah, the, you're right. The, there is this uh, problem of the assumption. And again, assumptions are, are often the things, including logics. Uh, the idea used to be that uh, formal logic and um, and pure mathematics, it was a, um, you know, some kind of like God thought, you know, it was, it was perfect. It was the perfection that it was, it was, it didn't, didn't have the problems that you had with induction and other kinds of thinking. Mm-hmm. And then uh, people who do logic don't accept that anymore. It's, it's all based on induction too. He pointed it out. He's perfectly right. Yeah. We can't do without induction. And what all of the categories and everything that we have, half of them are acquired categories. The others we were born with. So we didn't, you know, they're nothing, um, objective, as you say, nothing perfectly objective about any of those. So I am aware of the fact that you mentioned in your comments uh, that um, uh, you thought that maybe uh, uh, that I actually support Pyrrhonism or Pyrrhonian approaches myself. I don't not support them. Um, and I, some of my ideas, as I, from talking about the circular logic and so on, obviously accord very well with them. As somebody said, uh, he's actually doing philosophy. You know, <laughs> as a criticism. Uh, well, if you're trying to figure out a philosophical problem, how can you not do philosophy? That's my understanding. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I just, you know, <laughs> what can we say about that? But uh, you said that um, you, first you thought maybe I was like a typical sort of Orientalist uh, who was actually quite contemptuous of his subject matter and wouldn't dream of taking any of his Eastern stuff seriously. And so I know I'm definitely nothing like that. And uh, <laughs> Because uh, yeah. um, uh, that was, if I could just explain that, yeah. to the, that's because the first three chapters are so precise and dry, yeah, and oh, absolutely just about the scholarship. You know, oh, nothing oh. that indicates anything of your perspective uh, on it. Oh, uh-huh. No, I think I think that it was, uh, from my point of view, in order to make to to write chapter four. Actually, I had already written a draft of that years before. You know, I just put it aside and couldn't use it right at the time being. And I ended up completely redoing it from from scratch almost. But I'd worked on this uh, idea before, but uh, while working on it, it didn't really connect in my mind while I was working on most of the book. Uh, but uh, in order to be able to draw s- some sorts of conclusions and to be a, what can we do with this, you know, what, how can we use this? And, and from any point of view, including a religious point of view, I would really like to understand something about how those texts, what they're really saying. You know, what is that? Uh, you see text that's copied over so many times and it ends up in Eusebius. What's it really saying? Well, it's, I, I can't, couldn't agree with what anybody said. It, it, I had to do it myself. And then I found out there are lots of there are mistakes in it. You know, there were actual <laughs> one mistake anyway, one mistake, a textual error in it that nobody caught. And it was simply if you read a little bit more Eusebius, there it is. Oh, oh, <laughs> that's why it doesn't make sense. You know, aphasia, the problem of aphasia. There is no aphasia in that text at all. It's, you know, uh, just not there. But um, but anyhow, uh, but you needed to, to get those things right. And that's one of the things that you learn when you work if you do serious historical work, you need to make sure you examine your texts and get them the best you can before you try and draw any conclusions on it. 
and use all the different sources. So I do that. And, but I was going to get to this is that you said it's a, uh, you suggested it's about the middle way. The chapter is about the middle way. It's not really about the middle way exactly. In a way it is, uh, but it's really about trying to understand the way Piro was and, and Piro and the Buddha, Piro and Hume were thinking about this, these problems. And uh, so the middle way is a, a solution, you might say that the Buddha comes to, and I think Piro and, and Hume kind of come to the same, pretty, pretty much the same sort of conclusion. I think that I would disagree with you slightly, that I, I think the middle way is a method. Rather oh, yes, than yes, a solution. yes, 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 a method, exactly, yeah. a practice, a method, yes, mm. yes. I, I would want to say the same thing, that mm. yes, in fact, it's a kind of method. And you mentioned here something about a doctrine and other doctrines. No, 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 it, it's not... The middle way it wasn't a doctrine. It was definitely a, a method, a way of getting to some s solutions. And, to, and because if you can't, if it's difficult to teach something directly, how are you going to teach it? Well, if you do it indirectly in some way so that the other person can come to that uh, understanding themselves. So what the, the uh, old meaning of induction really was, you know, that, you know, Plato's sense of it. Uh, so how, that's how they're trying to do it, is to, to provide a method. If you follow this method, you do the sort of... So Buddha seems to me pretty obvious that, well, I figured it out, you know? Uh, but he was trying to figure out whatever it was. I figured it out. And so he thought, well, I'll tell other people how I figured it out, and then they can do it too. And I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And one of these things was this, what the medieval Buddhists refer to as heroic thinking. I think it's really a nice way of putting it. Mm. Um, Heroic thinking, thinking and uh, applying, trying from every direction, and finally he made this breakthrough, and he understood, oh, that's how it works, you know. And Piro had, didn't have to go through all those stages because he met somebody who was a Buddhist teacher who gave him still the fairly early Buddhist uh, ideas of it. He said, ah, oh, that's how it works, you know. And he went and formulated it very slightly differently, more or less the same way. And I think Hume, to some extent redid it because he got this very kind of a crappy form of Pyrrhonism by reading encyclopedia articles. But he still you know, got the basic idea anyway and uh, reformulated it to, for his own purposes. And I think anybody can do that then. But it's, it really does require a lot of heroic thinking and, and getting there. You know? But if somebody's done the work for you and you try and understand what they've done, that helps a lot. And I think that's... Uh, so I'm just trying to do that. You know? and then, but then at some point I thought, well... Okay, if we get there and we get this and we solve, if we end up with this, and you say, okay, the circular thinking, uh, uh, according to the rectilinear logic, uh, the traditional um, logic is in fact circular. It's all circular, so it's all invalid according to traditional logic. But that means, gosh, doesn't that mean circular logic should be uh, valid then? It must mean that, and that's the way we do think. All of our thinking is in fact non-rectilinear anyway. Circular logic. What does that mean? I want to figure that out. I got as far as I could, and then I had to stop. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not a specialist in it, and I asked several people who I thought would be able to, would be interested in it, but they're not really interested in it. So um, some, maybe somebody else will pick it up. So that's kind of where I got to. <laughs> the, um, I mean, see, I've, I've developed this kind of thinking in my own work. I don't know if that would be of any interest to you, but uh, mm. particularly the psychological basis of, of this kind of provisionality mm. um, that I see is linked to, to Piro. Yes. Yes, you mentioned the psychological aspect, and um, and I'm aware of, of the fact that there is it, the ethics, you know, uh, that was one thing you mentioned. So Piro's teachings are considered within the history of philosophy as by some people, and actually I'm not the first one by any means. There's some other important Got scholars not like me, they're important, and who worked on Piro and Greek philosophy and so on. And they said his teachings are, and actually the ancients, they mostly say he was an ethical teacher. But that doesn't mean necessarily our modern sense of ethics, uh, that is a socially, uh, you know, sort of social idea, pretty much. But it had to do with uh, with behavior and more like what you would say psychology is. So uh, um, so it's, it, was, it was not a social teaching in Buddhist, you leave your family, right? Uh, that's a, an expression for to become a Buddhist, a practicing Buddhist. You leave the family. Well, then what do you mean? What does it mean when you leave the family? It means you leave society to some extent. You, you do join a kind of another group. Those are the other people who are doing the same thing. But I think in the beginning, it wasn't, there was no Sangha. So it was really leaving society. 
and going beyond uh, humanity, as, as I put in my, one of my chapter titles, in a certain way, to try and find that. And so who are you doing that for? Are you doing it for yourself? And so people criticize this and later on. Later Buddhists, uh, some of them criticize it. It's not being you know, engaged enough with the society. Uh, and even in Megasini's account, there are these other two different basic varieties of Buddhists, of which then there are several apparently beginning to be some sects, different sectarian differences. But two basic differences are the ones who are kind of more doing the traditional thing, trying to, to achieve in the insights of, of the Buddha, and the others who are out there working to cure sick people and help them, you know, uh, with different uh, death rituals and things like that, practical work. So, I mean, that's the, the kind of people who I think would be criticizing the others, whereas the others would criticize them for not focusing enough on, you know, what it's all about is to try and understand how things, you know, not how things are, that's, uh, but how to understand just basically how to understand probably something like that and what that can do for you when you understand is mm. the, is the result but it's uh, if you say that then it's mm. not good because then you have this specific goal which means you're not going to get there <laughs> so they never say it the Piro doesn't say it mm. Mm. never mentions it it's Timon who says it but the implication is is of a a flexible uh, yes. Practice, yes practice in relation to, to it yes yeah. Yeah, I think so yeah. too. Could you explain one thing which, which puzzled me, which which was your references to normative Buddhism? I mean, what, what oh, did you yes. mean by normative Buddhism? Sorry about that. I didn't really mean to say. Some people think that I've. I, one, one reviewer said that when I use the word dogmatic uh, somewhere, you know, about dogmatic beliefs, oh, he's being so uh, critical, you know, and polemical. No, no, I was. The ancients used this word dogmatic. Uh, uh, Sexus Empiricus uses it to refer to a certain non-skeptical beliefs, non-Pyronian beliefs. So I didn't mean it in that way. I, I, I really just meant originally when I picked the term, I, it's, the, it's normal Buddhism. It's the one that we know, you know, the, what we, you know, what we're familiar with ah. from the canon, the canons, the Pali canon and the other canons um, down to pretty much recent times. That's kind of, so it was normal really that probably would have been better. But ah, yeah, right. Normative is there too, because all of those forms of Buddhism are also normative. I, I don't know if, if you would um, exactly agree with me on it, but uh, but Buddhists are supposed to follow, uh, you know, right have right mind and right practices and right this and right that and not wrong. You know, right, right. It's, there's lists of these things in the, the different lists of, of, of Buddhist uh, aspects of practice, the Four Noble Truths and the Eight Noble Eightfold Path and everything. Uh, but uh, there's all this, uh, it is prescriptive, a lot of prescriptive stuff. And as long as the, the, it is there, that's normative. But that's not in, uh, in as far as I can tell, in early Buddhism. That there's nothing like that. I mean, in, in the Buddhist teachings, in Puro's teachings, as far as we can understand, as far as I've been able to get to them. Well, in, in the broader sense that a philosopher would use normative, I think early Buddhism is normative. I mean, you, you make it clear that, that Puro's teachings have, as we would, you were saying just now have moral implications. You know, it's, it's part of a moral practice in, in uh, one's whole life, which you know, in ways that overlap with what we now discuss as psychology. So uh, mm. that's that was the puzzling aspect for me. I think mm. that, that it seemed to imply that early Buddhism was not normative, uh, mm. which, in the broader sense in which I'm accustomed to using the word normative, mm. it obviously is. Um, um, but perhaps you had a particularly narrow sense in mind of the word. Normative. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, normal I, I, would make more sense, I think. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I also don't think that, uh, I mean, Piro is specifically said to have been non-normative, you might say, in that sense of your sense of the word that he didn't prescribe and, and said you shouldn't have he explicitly says, you, and as the, the Buddha is said to have, have said, and I think he, he must have, that you shouldn't have any beliefs. Well, don't have you, beliefs. You don't you in that sentence, which is itself normative. Uh, it's an, it's a normative sentence. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In that sense, right. All right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's not about specific moral rules necessarily. It's just about having a sense of should is is normative. Right. Right. Mm. right. In that that sense, of course. Uh, uh, but of course, if if, it, if Pure were around and he was <laughs> said, did you say that? You know, isn't that normative? <laughs> <laughs> That, that's Timo, and I didn't say I didn't have anything to do with that. If he was Sorry. around, I, I get the sense that he would accept that there, there were values in his life, which perhaps emerged from his uh -huh. experience. 
yes, um, yes, he didn't yes. want dogmas to dictate his values. That's exactly but, but right. Exactly, he did right. have values. And he he was again. It's the phenomena, right? In the phenomena world, and so he's living in the phenomena world, and and we just live according to customs or whatever like that. That's what they all say. Uh, that's what he said, and what uh, the early Pyrrhonists did. So uh, to some extent, then they accepted uh, normativity, uh, but as a part of the phenomenal world. And the po- whole point is that it it shouldn't be anything that should be taken beyond that to a meta level, to you know the reality, the real world, to the you know, the perfect world and all these other ideas. As long as that's understood, then there's nothing wrong with, with uh, that normative thing. But I think in the in the later Buddhism, which I refer to as normative Buddhism, um, that there is, in fact, um, this kind of appeal to perfectionism is there. I think that they, they adopted all sorts of uh, things which Buddha rejected. Uh, as just as most other religions, there are many other religions that they end up adopting stuff that's it's explicitly rejected by the founder, you know. So uh, I think it's a typical thing uh, for people to do. But yeah, I don't I don't see how there's a problem with it insofar as long as you keep it within that uh, the, the the idea that it's part of the phenomenal world and, and doesn't go beyond that. So because we like to do that with our ethical ideas too. Is to make sure that you know that those are ideal and they're perfections and so on. Uh, shouldn't be any, I think. Yeah, but that's a, you're very right to point out that, that I that I don't make that clear anyway. That's for for sure. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, it's been a, a great pleasure hearing you talk about your book, uh, Chris, and uh, thank you very much for coming and and thank you, Robert, for uh, uh, joining in the discussion too. Okay. Thank you very much, and nice to meet you both, and nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks. You can find out more about Middle Way Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.